musicians and scientists, you might think they don't mix, but you'd be wrong. The story of life on this crazy planet, the protagonist is mad. No, it's a microscopic information package called deoxyribonucleic acid. The DNA's... Rappers like Baba Brinkman, who you just heard, have been using verse to communicate science for some time now. Even the popular MC Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan has a science-themed album called Dark Matter in the works. But humans have been composing sciencey songs for a very long time. And some of them did it in secret. Stick around till later in the show to find out more. Plus, the e-cigarette debate, a beverage-based flame retardant, and a super strong material worthy of a superhero. All that and more in this episode of Speaking of Chemistry. From Chemical and Engineering News, this is Speaking of Chemistry, your source for chemistry news in minutes. CNEN is the weekly magazine from the American Chemical Society. Find it at cen.acs.org. Here are your hosts, Lauren Wolf and Carmen Drawl. I'm Carmen Drawl, and this month we're starting the program with silk. Spider silk, to be exact. We asked our followers on Twitter what we should cover on the show. An engineering student with the handle Chirologist responded, Polymers must love polymers. And we figured biopolymers count. So we spoke to Randy Lewis at Utah State University. Lewis has a story he likes to tell to show people just how strong spider silk is. Fair warning, he's something of a Spider-Man fan. So there's a scene in the second Spider-Man movie um, where Spider-Man stops a runaway train and we were interested in whether that really would fit with the properties that we knew about spider silk. So, Lewis did what any good chemist would do, a calculation. He guesstimated how many lines of silk Spider-Man used and roughly how thick each one was. Then he factored in how much the train weighed and how fast it was going. Um, and the answer was, he would have been able to stop that train. Okay, spider silk is pretty strong. Companies are looking at a host of applications for it. Unfortunately, farm-raised spiders are territorial and tend to eat each other. So firms are trying to make spider silk without spiders. That's easier said than done. Spider silk is a complex mix of multiple silks, each with different mechanical properties. So our approach has been to clone the genes for each of those different spider silks um, and then take those genes and move them into other organisms to produce spider silk. One of the four organisms Lewis's company Arachnitech is trying is E. coli. That's the organism of choice for most of the biotech industry. But the rest of the menagerie is more unusual. There's the alfalfa plant, silkworms, and even goats. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Did you just say goats? Yeah, that's right, goats. These are genetically engineered goats that produce the silk protein in the milk, Lauren. All you need to do to get the protein out is purify the milk. The problem is that compared to something like E. coli, it's not as easy to scale commercially. Oh, okay. Well, that clears that up. Um, what kinds of spider silk products can I buy right now? Not a lot yet, to be honest with you. Of the five or so small companies that are leaders in the spider silk space, only one is actually commercial at this point. That would be the German startup Amsilk. It is selling spider silk protein to makers of cosmetics and shampoos to give them that all-important silky feel. <laughs> Sounds delightful. Uh, that's a trend to watch. Uh, thanks, Carmen. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches seeds just like guys. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. That was the 1960s theme song for Spider-Man. Our next story is about vaping. And nope, that's not a superpower used by one of Spider-Man's friends. It's a pastime on the rise across the country. That's right. You might have noticed the ads for electronic cigarettes popping up on TV or magazines. You might have even seen a person take a puff from one of these e-cigs and then immediately put it away in a pocket. <laughs> yeah, the first time I saw someone do that, I was more than a little bit worried. Some of these devices look exactly like regular cigarettes, and I was waiting for this person's pants to catch fire. <laughs> <laughs> so we've established these things don't burn like regular cigarettes. What do we know about how they work? 
Well, they run on batteries. In the reusable models, a person fills the compartment inside the device with what folks are calling e-juice. That's a mixture of water, glycerol or propylene glycol, nicotine, and flavoring compounds. Thanks to those flavors, your e-cigarette could taste and smell like, say, cotton candy. Yum. Mm -hmm. A heating element inside the e-cigarette vaporizes this e-juice, so when a user takes a puff, he gets a quick hit of the addictive nicotine and exhales a cloud of white vapor, thus the nickname vaping. Catchy. So I've heard the rise in popularity of these e-cigs has raised questions about their health risks. What do we know about that? Well, that's the question of the hour. Experts say these things are safer than regular cigarettes because they don't contain tobacco and therefore aren't emitting many of the carcinogens produced by burning tobacco. But some scientists have analyzed e-cigarette vapor and found small amounts of things like formaldehyde, toluene, acrolein, things you generally don't want to be inhaling. And they've also found tiny amounts of metals like cadmium, nickel, and lead. Those things are also found in regular cigarettes. Uh, but unfortunately right now, the only way for us to know whether it's bad for people to inhale low levels of these things over time is to, well, wait and see what happens. It's early in the morning About a quarter till three Talking with my baby over cigarettes and coffee. That was Cigarettes and Coffee by the late, great Otis Redding. And our next story also involves cigarettes in a roundabout way. Much of the upholstered furniture and plastic inside American homes contains flame retardants. That's largely to prevent a smoldering cigarette from causing a big fire. But many flame retardant compounds are under fire themselves because of their potentially harmful effects on human health and the environment. We talked to Karina Wu, associate editor at CNN, to learn more. She says researchers are looking into milk as an eco-friendly flame retardant. Well, milk contains proteins called caseins. The researchers are looking at caseins as potential flame retardants because they contain a lot of phosphate groups. That makes them similar to some of the compounds that are currently used as flame retardants. So how well does this actually perform? Uh, the casings actually did pretty well. These researchers tested it by first coating fabric samples with casein, and then they did some standard flammability tests on the fabrics. What they found was that in 100% cotton and 100% polyester fabrics, the flames would actually put themselves out. The casein technology has a few kinks to work out, including a not-so-pleasant stench. Plus, a commenter at CNN's website reminds us that some people are severely allergic to casein. More as it develops. We mentioned at the top of the show that music and science have been coming together in perfect harmony for ages. In fact, in the 1600s, a German alchemist named Michael Meyer used music to encode some research he was doing. Sarah Everts, a senior editor with the Science and Technology Group at CNEN, recently wrote about this tuneful tale. So why would an alchemist use a musical score to hide his work? Well, alchemists were well known for being extremely secretive about their strategies for making the philosophers a stone, which is, as you know, the long sought after agent of transmutation. It's capable of turning base metals into precious gold and silver, and it's an elixir for human health and longevity. So many alchemists did not want any old Joe Schmo to be able to make this highly desirable entity. So they used images, some of them pretty weirdly wonderful. We're talking two-headed hermaphrodites lying on burning pyres or dragons biting their own tails to describe the steps in their recipes for making the philosophers a stone. And then we have Michael Meyer. He was a 17th century German alchemist who decided to seriously up the secret of ante by slipping the recipe for the philosophers of stone into a musical score. Well, that's pretty crafty, but how did he do it? So in 1617, Meyer produces a guide for making the philosophers of stone called the Atalanta Fugians. It's got a lot of these fabulously crazy images, but it also has a musical score. And a historian named Donna Billack recently discovered that the three individual parts in the musical score refer to actual ingredients for making the philosophers of stone. So one of the musical parts represents mercury, another part is sulfur, and the third is a stand-in for salt. Well, we actually 
have a vocal rendition of Meyer's alchemical music. Let's take a listen as we head into our next story. And finally, we're wrapping up with a segment in which we ask, what's that stuff? CNN Associate Editor Sophia Kai is here to give us the lowdown. Thanks, Lauren. First up, we have the fruit loofah. You know, the sponge-like... Oh, hold, hold up. That comes from a fruit? <laughs> yeah, it's actually a popular food in China, too. Okay. And, it turns out, loofah seeds can be used to treat diabetes. Researchers at a Chinese biopharma institute have filed a patent saying that loofah seed capsules can reduce blood glucose levels and, when taken with conventional diabetes drugs, can actually heighten their effects. These scientists also say that loofah seeds may prevent people who have a genetic predisposition for diabetes from developing the disease. So I guess next time you're in the shower, thank your lucky loofah for its health benefits. <laughs> okay. What else? All right, get ready, ladies. Goodyear is beginning test flights on its newest blimp. Whoa, wait, wait, what? Those are still flying around? Are they ever? And these aren't your grandpa's Goodyear blimps. These nearly 200-foot-long airships stay afloat by filling up with helium, but they aren't like massive latex party balloons. These newest ship bodies are made of polyester covered with DuPont's Tedlar polyvinyl fluoride film which protects against harsh weather and ultraviolet light. You know, so when the blimps are flying around in the sun, wind, and rain, it's all protected. And these Tedlar films aren't new in general. Their properties also come in handy when protecting solar cell modules from the elements. That's all the time we have for Speaking of Chemistry. You can get more details about this episode's stories from all five March issues of Chemical and Engineering News, or on our website, cen.acs.org. Support for CNN and the show comes from the American Chemical Society. If you like their program, react with us. You can reach us on Twitter with the hashtag SpeakingOfChem or by email at speakingofchem at acs.org. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Special thanks to Donna Billack, audio engineer Daniel Drago, and the Chemical Heritage Foundation for the recording of the Atalanta Fugians. Thanks to Baba Brinkman for the song, DNA.